once upon a time in China, a girl named Li Li got married and went to live with her husband and mother-in-law. In a short time, Li Li found she couldn't get along with her mother-in-law at all. Their personalities and habits were very different, and her mother-in-law criticized Li Li constantly. Days and weeks passed. Li Li and her mother-in-law never stopped fighting. All this anger, all this unhappiness in the house was causing Li Li's poor husband tremendous distress. Finally, Li Li could not stand her mother-in-law's bad temper and dictatorship any longer, and she decided to do something about it. Li Li went to see her father's good friend, Mr. Huang, who sold herbs. She told him the situation and asked if he would give her some poison so she could solve the problem once and for all. Mr. Wong thought a while and said, Lily, I will help you solve your problem, but you must do whatever I tell you. Lily said, yes, Mr. Huang, I will do whatever you tell me to do. Mr. Huang went into the back room and returned with a package of herbs. He told Lily, you can't use a quick-acting poison because that would cause people to become suspicious. Therefore, I have given you a number of herbs that will slowly build up in her body. Every other day, put a little in her meal. Now, in order to make sure that no one that he suspects you, you must be very careful to act friendly towards her. Don't argue with her, obey her every wish, and treat her like a queen. Lily hurried home to start her murderous plot. Every other day, Lily served the specially treated food to her mother-in-law. She remembered what Mr. Huang said about avoiding suspicion, so she controlled her temper, obeyed her mother-in-law, and treated her like her own mother. After six months, the household had changed. Lily had controlled her temper so much that she almost never got upset. She no longer argued with her mother-in-law, and the old woman was much kinder and easier to get along with. She kept telling friends and relatives that Lily was the best daughter-in-law ever. Lily's husband was tremendously happy to see what was happening. So one day, Lily went to see Mr. Huang and said, Dear Mr. Huang, please help me to keep the poison from killing my mother-in-law. She has changed into such a nice woman, and I love her like my own mother. Mr. Huang smiled and nodded his head. Lily, there is nothing to worry about. I never gave you poison. The herbs I gave you were vitamins for her health. The only poison was in your mind and your attitude towards her, but that has been washed away by the love which you showed her. So it's a story that's an example of what we call the golden rule. Also an example of, maybe without even choosing it, taking the narrow way. So when Jesus finally summarizes the Sermon on the Mount, he does so with this rule. Matthew 7, 12. So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. He follows that summary with a challenge, because even with dependence on God, the Sermon on the Mount brings us, individually and personally, to a decision point. Will we go God's way, as outlined in the sermon, or will we go our own way? Way. So let's begin with that summary, which, which is called the golden rule. All right, it's not invented by Jesus, but it is found, at least in its negative form, in many ancient records. For example, just 10 years or so before Jesus, Rabbi Hillel, challenged by a Gentile to summarize the law in the time it took the gent that the Gentile could stand on one leg, this is what he said. What is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. This is the whole law. All the rest is commentary. But only Jesus phrased the rule 
positively. It not only keeps us from doing harm, but it tells us how to do good. And Jesus' wording helps us to recognize that he is providing a summary, or you might call it a motto, for the whole Sermon on the Mount. He says the golden rule fulfills the law and the prophets. You may remember that that's where he began, with the law and the prophets. Chapter 5, his righteousness that fulfills the law and the prophets. The golden rule would also point, therefore, to the law of love. Jesus will later say that the two greatest commandments were to love God and to love others, and he says, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Paul, too, says in Romans 13, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Right? So this golden rule leads us to the law of love and the fulfilling of the law and the prophets. Furthermore, this rule reinforces many of the things that we've heard in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus told us to let our light shine before others by doing good deeds toward them. He told us that anger and lust and retribution against others were to be taken very seriously. He told us to go the second mile, to turn the other cheek, to give and not refuse, to love even your enemies. All these things that would be made logical by the golden rule. He, he says that even our fasting, our giving, and our praying express love. So for the second week, I think, Jesus is moving toward the completion of the sermon. Last week, we saw that in light of the deep demands of the sermon on our character, we needed to pray for God's good gifts, spiritual gifts, in our lives. This golden rule also pushes us toward that same dependence on God. I mean, we are so self-centered, self-motivated, self-fulfilled, that even the simple act of treating other the people the way we want to be treated is hard for us. We're, we're distracted by our quest to get our needs met. We're blind often to the needs of others. So we need to accept the golden rule, like all the other teaching in the sermon, as, as a motivation for complete dependence on God in prayer. And yet, that doesn't leave us without the responsibility to live out this sermon, to live these things out. Jesus next challenges us to choose his way or our own way. We're, we're free to make these choices between his teachings and the leadings of our fallen hearts or the ways of a fallen world or the conceits of our fallen enemy. So this is chapter 7 now, verses 13 to 23, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? So, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The culture we live in thinks that there are many ways to God. Or some people think there are no ways to God. But all people in our culture tend to think that which way we go is our own personal choice. And Jesus thinks that there are only two real choices, man's way and God's way. 
And with this perfect word picture, he shows how that's true. God's way, he says, is a narrow path, probably narrow because so few people have walked on it. But the wrong path is wide because so many enter it, having made what appear to be wildly different choices, materialism, polytheism, atheism, dozens of work-based religions, or simply that blind preoccupation with pleasure or power. These are all turnings to the wide path, and all of these share an essential self-focus. All these things depend on me. Either I choose a religion where I have to work to get to heaven, or I make myself my own God and I shake my fist at heaven. And Jesus says all of these wide way choices lead to one place, destruction. God's way, on the other hand, is narrow, but it leads to eternal life. I mean, God's way is, in a very real sense, Jesus himself. Um, in John's gospel, he said, as we heard earlier, well, uh, he says first, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. So he's that narrow gate. And then he goes on to say, I'm also the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. God's only provision for man's salvation and entrance to the kingdom is faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah, King, and Savior. He is the one who allows us to enter that narrow way. And in that door, we find him. But all people are faced with this choice. You can approach God through the narrow way, trusting in the blood of Jesus, in his sacrifice, the price of sin paid on the cross. Or you can go the other way, through the wide gate, with all its alternative philosophies, and find yourself, by whatever path you take, at the judgment seat of God, still burying your sin. Jesus here gathers up all, all our excuses, all our evasions, all of our alternate religions, gathers them together at that crossroads, and he says, friends, here's where everything divides. Here's where your choices are meaningful. What will you choose? This narrow way really bothers those who don't believe. Why, why do you Christians think that you have the only way? And it's true at times that Christians convey this truth with such superiority or pride or anger or evident hypocrisy that, that we make it unappealing. We need to appeal to a dying world with humility and tears to turn toward Jesus. But it's true also that many in the world would admit, if they were being honest, that they're not really bothered by the fact that there's only this one answer, but that to take that way is to turn from their pride, their possessions, their pleasures, their self-focus, and their self-fulfillment, and they just simply don't want to do that. Uh, again, in a sense, they've got a good point, don't they? The path of the unbeliever is a wide road, and it seems easy. Just do whatever you want. The path you enter through the narrow gate is narrow. It's hard. In fact, it's fascinating that the word narrow means compressed or pushed on, and it's a, a root word that's sometimes also used for the idea of persecution in the New Testament. God's people walking down Jesus' way will be pushed on by the world. They'll be tried. They'll be tested. They'll be tempted by tribulation and trouble. It's a narrow way. And yet Jesus says it's the way that leads to life. So again, in the larger sense, we have to recognize that there are two ways and that your choice is meaningful. Have you chosen the narrow way of faith in Christ and in Christ alone, trusting in his redeeming sacrifice to be rescued and saved? 
Or have you, by not choosing that, chosen the wide gate that puts faith only in yourself or some false religion and that leads away from God's loving rescue? We have to prefer Jesus' way. And that, that's the broad biblical context uh, of these two few verses, to turn to Christ or to stick with self. But in the immediate context of the Sermon on the Mount, this, these verses also point to choices that we have. And we can choose obedience to the path of life that the sermon lays out in these three chapters, the, the narrow way of dependence on God in specific situations, or we can choose, even as believers, to go our own way relative to these things and reap the consequences of our disobedience, maybe not destruction, but often misery. All right, the remainder of the paragraph is evidence that we can use to tell which way we are on. If, you, if you've entered on the wide way, Jesus says you'll, you'll encounter this tree, and it's, a, it's an unhealthy tree that produces poor fruit. That's what you'll be like. If you're on the narrow way, there's a tree there too, but it's a, it's a healthy tree that produces good fruit, and that's what you'll be like. Again, if you're on the wide way, you may, name, you may claim to know Jesus, but he will not claim to know you. If you're on the narrow way, the unstated corollary to the last verses is that you do know Jesus, and he does know you. So all the good stuff's on the narrow way, all the sad stuff's on the wide way. Let's take a look at it. Verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. The, the New Testament inherits from the Old a recognition that some who claim to speak in the name of God are not genuine. They come, Jesus says, in sheep's clothing. They seem committed to God. They may even seem committed to Jesus. They may seem zealous. They may even seem to love. But inside, they're still wolves whose purpose, often unadmitted to themselves, is to tear each other down. These false prophets, Jesus says, can be recognized by their fruits. You, you see, a wolf, even if he's wrapped in a sheepskin, will still be our carnivorous animal. Similarly, Jesus says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Can something produce something totally alien to itself? Don Carson says, from a distance, the berries on the buckthorn could be taken for grapes, and the flowers on the thistle might deceive one into thinking they were figs, but no one would long be deceived. So with people, one's fruit will ultimately reveal itself. So in verses 17 and 18, Jesus describes these, these two trees, tells us what to look for. He says, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. What are these fruits? We're looking at ourselves. We're looking at others around us. We have to be careful because false prophets can sometimes appear to have good fruit. They may be attested by convincing signs and seeming wonders. As Jesus says in verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and in your name perform many miracles? And Paul will write, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. But if religious works, religious wonders, outward acts are not a reliable way to look for fruit in our own lives or someone else's life, what is a reliable way? Scripture gives us more, but it gives us at least two reliable guides. First, 
doctrine. False prophets speak disease, not revelation. Their words do not conform to the truth of Scripture. They, they point down instead to a wide way that they say is Christian, but that contradicts scriptural truth. And very often you'll find that they deny the deity of Christ or that they reject his work on the cross. Jeremiah 23 describes this saying, they, he's talking of false prophets, they speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of God, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. They tell people what they want to hear, follow your own heart. How many times have we heard that in our culture? But Paul tells Timothy, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. There are many popular Christian so-called Christians today, who believe false doctrine. We've talked about the prosperity gospel and how its false doctrine of wealth and health is cruel to those who try to trust in it. But there are others. I mean, what about the heresies of the so-called mainline churches? Many churches around us don't believe that the Bible is the word of God, but is the fallible work of men. To some around us, the life and teachings, even the death and resurrection of Jesus, are thought to be pleasant fabrications. Many around us deny that Jesus is the only way of salvation, or that salvation is even needed because everyone gets saved. God loves everybody. God would never punish anyone. Jesus was just a, a good moral teacher who inspired his followers by his unfortunate death with no resurrection needed. Now, can a person be saved in a liberal church that teaches those kind of things? Yes, it can happen. Some get saved by exposure to believers who still sit in those pews as believers. Some get saved by the residual truth that can't be kept out of the tradition and ritual and Sunday scripture readings. I was saved in a liberal Presbyterian church because of a subversive, excuse me, the word is subversive youth pastor who really believed in Jesus. But the common factor among these churches, the common factor among these heresies, the common factor with all false prophets is the refusal to take God's word seriously and plainly whether it's a Benny Hinn seeing health and wealth in a Savior who endured poverty and shame, or a mainline church that doesn't see adultery or divorce or cohabitation or porn or LGBTQ plus lifestyles as, as issues of sin. The, the, the bottom line behind all of that is taking Scripture plainly. The second major category of fruit by which people can be judged is their own moral character or the moral character they build in others. Paul's letters to Titus, to Timothy, Peter's second letter, among others, warn God's people against those who see so-called godliness as a means of gain, of power, of influence, or of financial gain, or of sexual gain. Peter says, Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. And he adds that they indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. And we've seen this way too often. In any given month, some megachurch pastor or some local church leader has resigned because of sexual or financial or or power scandals. In any given month, some Christian, well-known or unknown, has been involved in sexual abuse of others. Now, I'm not saying all of those were false teachers. Temptation makes true believers stupid as well. But in many of these cases, the sin is accompanied by some degree 
of false teaching. So Jesus says, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. These are the outcomes of choices we make, looking not at the false teachers themselves, not out there at somebody else, but we look within it and see whether I'm tending away from biblical doctrine. You see, whether I'm tending away from biblical behavior, the, the, the choice we have is to go the narrow way of believing and living what we've been taught in the Sermon on the Mount. The other choice is to go the wide way and believe and live in ways that are other than Jesus taught us. And at some point, you and I here, really at many points, in our spiritual life, at the one point where we turn to Jesus in faith and at the many points where we make choices to give in or turn away from temptation, we make a choice to take Jesus seriously, to take scripture seriously, and to place ourselves under it rather than over it. You make the choice to take righteousness seriously and to desperately seek the Holy Spirit's help in dealing with temptation and sin. But if you do these two things, to, to humbly submit to Scripture, to humbly submit to sanctification, Jesus says, yeah, your life is going to produce good fruit. If you don't submit to Scripture and you won't recognize your need for sanctification from sin, your life is going to produce rotten fruit. But Jesus sharpens the point even more. He says it really comes down to knowing Jesus or not. Verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There are some who through lack of relationship with the king will not enter the kingdom even though they cry, Lord, Lord. Not everyone, even among those who know Jesus' name and address him with respect or even reverence, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only those who do the will of his father their Father, who is in heaven. Remember, in chapter 6, Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, implying relationship, implying knowledge. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Anyone who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the cry of our prayer. It's a, it's a relationship that leads to obedience. Those who are on the narrow way are more and more interested in what God desires and not in what they desire. And that has what are called eschatological implications. Eschatology, right? Eschatology is simply the study of the end times. What did Jesus believe and teach about himself and about the end of history? This is what Bible scholars ask, but Jesus makes something pretty plain here in verse 22. He talks about that day. You remember that from our studies in the, in the prophets last year? That day is a common Old Testament phrase that looks forward to the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, the day of the ultimate rescue. And on that day, Jesus says, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Jesus teaches that he is and will be the one that people appeal to. He depicts himself as Lord in the strong Old Testament sense where Lord substituted for the word Yahweh. He claims that same rule, that same authority, and he claims to be the kingdom's gatekeeper. Now, so these people come to him. They appeal to him, Lord, Lord, for entrance in the kingdom, and they bring forth what sounds like this powerful argument. Did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? I mean, that strikes you as a pretty strong thing. How could these things happen if God was not involved with them? 
if God was not approving of them? And the answer is that God can permit Satan to counter these things, counterfeit these things. And I believe that still happens too often today. And the second answer is that God can sometimes do these things for his own purposes without having to use redeemed people. He can, if he chooses, answer a prayer even from an unrighteous person. So, so God may have some good reason for allowing these people to, to have some spiritual impact, but that's not going to influence their eternal destiny, for he judges by what's in the heart. John's Gospel says, but Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, all these followers, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. He looks on their hearts and says, verse 23, and then while I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart me from me, you workers of lawlessness. The key, the key word is obviously new. This is, this is the strong knowledge that comes with relationship. Certainly he knew about them. They knew about him. But there was no relationship forged in his love and their trust. There was no relationship forged in his love for them and their trust in him. All the works they were doing, seemingly in his name, were worth exactly nothing in that day. It is on this basis that Jesus decides who enters the kingdom and who is banished from his presence to the fate of the wide way walkers. Notice that this paragraph is clear evidence of the deity of Christ and of the fact that he knew he was God. He says, it's knowing me that makes the difference. And there's the contrast between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Those who enter the wide way, as I said, may know about Christ. Many do in our culture. They may have grown up in a, in a mainline church where they heard about Jesus and his love but never heard the heart-changing truth about sin and their personal need for him. Or they may have grown up in an emotional, wonder-working church where they thought they saw many miraculous things, where they've been drawn into many emotions, but maybe they never engaged with sin and repentance and turning on the narrow way and walking in sanctification. So all they can do on that day is try to take credit for things that either God or Satan did. But they cannot claim to have known Jesus in a relational way, to have received his forgiveness and redemption and walked with him personally. So because we're approaching the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and because my time in the sermon this spring has convinced me even more of the central importance of the sermon for living our lives. I want to once again challenge us to apply these few verses to the specific attitudes and behaviors we've seen in this sermon. Last week we did this. We applied the concept of asking, seeking, and knocking to the hard attitudes called for in this sermon, recognizing that in these things we utterly depend on God, and that's true. But this week I want to apply the concept of the narrow way, the narrow gate, to these behaviors taught in the sermon, recognizing this week, in addition to our need to depend, our need to choose these behaviors. So here's a few. In the Beatitudes, we're, called, we're told, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Isn't that kind of a golden rule kind of a thing? Do unto others as you would have them. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy is also a choice between the, the wide way that includes revenge, hard-heartedness, indifference, anger, or the narrow way that approaches people with compassion. Same is true for many of these things. Peacemaking. The wide ray, way ranges from peace faking to verbal, relational, or even physical attacks on our perceived enemies, but the narrow way Jesus taught us in the sermon was to go and be reconciled 
to your brother or sister. Again, Jesus taught us to be salt, preserving truth in a culture of decay, and to be light, revealing truth in a culture of darkness. But those are both narrow way choices. It's easier to lose your saltiness, to go along with the majority opinions of the culture around you. It's easier to kind of tuck your light under the basket and just not mention Jesus or faith. But Jesus says that when you let your, let your light shine before others, they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus taught us to turn from the wide way of anger to the narrow way of reconciling. He taught us to turn from the wide, wide way of lust and no-fault divorce to the narrow way of purity and faithfulness. He taught us to turn from retaliation to the narrow way of turning the other cheek, going the second mile. He taught us to turn from hating our enemies to the narrow way of loving and praying for them. He taught us that the narrow way is to give, not to be seen, but for the sake of the kingdom. He taught us to pray, not first for our own needs, but for the glory of God and the triumph of his, of his will, and not just to pray for ourselves, but for others, and not just for physical needs, but for the deeper spiritual needs that we see in this sermon. He taught us not to be anxious. Being anxious is the wide way, but to seek his kingdom and his righteousness, trusting in a loving God, who provides for us on the narrow way. So again, all of these are choices between the wide way of putting self first and the narrow way of putting God first. Jesus has reminded us today that the first choice we have to make is to turn to him in faith and receive his forgiveness, rescue, and help. That's the entrance to the narrow way of life. But the daily choices that make life worth living are those that turn us into the specific, narrow ways that Jesus has laid out. 